Hey there, everybody. Welcome back to the Primary Care Podcast. It is your boy, Dr. Mark Lista, back at you with another episode today. Uh, Before we get into today's episode, we are going to hit up the Primary Care Podcast for a possible joke. Uh, Yeah, it's a good joke, actually, um, from an anonymous uh, listener. Uh, Dr. List, hey, I got a joke for you. A guy walks into a sperm bank. The doctor says, get a load of this guy. All right, let's start the podcast. The Primary Care Podcast is written and edited by a physician for an audience of other physicians, nurse practitioners, physicians, assistants, residents, medical students interested in primary care topics. This is not a podcast for patients. It should not be used as medical advice. This is also a personal podcast produced in my own time and solely reflecting my personal opinions. Statements of this podcast do not reflect the views, policies of my employer, past or present, or any other organization with which I may be affiliated. Thank you for listening to the Primary Care Podcast. I'm Dr. Mark List, here to bring you the latest news, guidelines, and updates from primary care sources around the globe. Keeping it under 15 minutes long because you're in a hurry and I'm not that smart. Well, welcome back to the podcast, pod girls, pod boys, pod people. It is your favorite uh, doctor slash podcast slash bad dad joke uh, 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 podcaster, uh, Dr. Mark List, at you with another episode of the Primary Care Pod. Um, thanks for tuning in today. We've got an interesting topic that I want to do a little bit something different I've never done before. I uh, had a med student with me today, and uh, or this week wasn't today. Uh, that would not be correct. But I had a med student with me uh, earlier this week, and we talked about a patient who's coming in for pink eye. And it, it brought up an article that I had read several years back that I thought was one of the best physical exam systematic reviews I've ever read about you know a specific physical exam in a subset of patients. And I'm going to read this to you today. Um, not the whole thing, obviously. That'd be pretty, pretty darn boring. But in in 2015, uh, the journal uh, American Journal of Medicine um, had an article s- entitled "The Bedside Diagnosis of the Red Eye: A Systematic Review." And you know me, I don't like just doing physical exam stuff because we're supposed to do physical exam stuff. And historically, we've always been told do this because it tells us this. Uh, because then you lead to things like the Holman's exam, which is a terrible, terrible physical exam uh, for DVT. And it gives you a false sense of security if it's negative or a, a, a false, a lot of false positives that, oh, the, the calf hurts. So, oh, there, therefore, we're having a, a possible DVT. And, and a lot of our physical exam findings are really non-scientific. The sensitivity and specificity on them are pretty garbage. The likelihood ratios, um, if they're positive, are really low, and the negative likelihood ratios, if they're not there, um, are, are also uh, really, really low. And so this article shows that it's really easy to differentiate uh, different types of conjunctivitis, and we'll get into that. And also, there are some really good findings for when you need to be concerned about serious red eye disease. And when we talk about serious red eyes, we're not talking about, obviously, a completely different story if a patient has a history of trauma to the eye or chemical burns to the eye. A totally different ballgame. Obviously, those are, are very serious and need to be uh, addressed. But these are just uh, patients that walk into the clinic uh, with, a, uh, with a red eye without any history of trauma or, or exposures uh, or chemical exposures, et cetera, to the eye, um, who you know, do we differentiate sick, not sick? Well, if it's an eye, it's hard to tell if they're sick, not sick, right? Um, And so this article does a really good job, I think, of breaking down sick, not sick, and then physical exam findings uh, to look out for and differentiate different types of conjunctivitis. So if you're like me, right, uh, I I like things being really super simple and also very scientific-based. So I think you'll really like this this podcast uh, uh, topic today. so according to traditional teaching, um, the three findings that we always talk about, or at least I always talk about with med students, um, to, for serious red eye disorders, right? Significant eye pain is always a concern. Um, visual uh, blurring, blurring of the vision, right? And photophobia. And those, though, are really not statistically though that great of findings. Um, they're very subjective. And they're, they're, they don't have a really good high likelihood ratios, whether they're positive or negative. Um, in general, though, those are three things that should warrant. Um, or if all three are present, they, they should warrant at least further um, investigation, probably by an ophthalmologist um, or at least a slit lamp exam. Because uh, the main things we watch out for, right, are anterior uveitis, uh, keratitis, corneal abrasions, scleritis. Um, obviously, if they have um, herpes infection, that's another big one um, that we talk about. And, and But interestingly, you know, 
I always in med school and in residency was always taught that uh, these people, you know, they need a dilated eye exam, you need to look at their eyes, you need to try to, you know, get them to a slit lamp. And and for those severe disorders, uh, and and potentially that would that would make your diagnosis a lot easier, potentially, um, the fluorescein testing, et cetera. Um, but really, there's, there's only a couple of findings um, on the physical exam that according to systematic review trials of, uh, and what this study did is it looked at many, 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 many physical exams uh, uh, trials. And really there were only a, key, a couple of key findings uh, to differentiate um, something that you need to be worried about from a severe red eye disease versus benign red eye disease. And, and those three things, and these studies, again, included more than 1,000 patients in these multiple physical exam trials, right? Um, and, and all of these patients had confirmed severe eye disease or confirmed non-severe eye disease with eventual slit lamp exam. But these physical exam findings were very, very, very helpful. And we'll talk about the likelihood ratios as well. Okay, so number one, anisocoria which for those of you who don't remember that, I didn't remember it until I read this because of course I don't do a ton of eye stuff, is when one pupil is smaller than the other one by greater than one millimeter, okay? That that has a strong indication, right? Pupillary di differences, the size of the pupils being different, has a high likelihood of, of there being an underlying inflammatory or severe red eye process going on. Again, anything that can cause um, iritis, anterior uveitis, uh, keratitis, uh, things like that, that can cause significant scarring or inflammation internally, scleritis, um, that can cause issues with pupillary dilation mechanism. That's, that's something that we need to be concerned about, right? So check pupil diameters, okay? That's number one. Number two, look for pain during pupillary constriction, specifically, right, direct light photophobia. You shine a light directly in that eye and they say, ow, as the pupil constricts. That has a likelihood ratio of 8.3, so eight times more likely that there's something severe going on if they have a red eye and they have direct light reaction causing pain with constriction, okay? And a 28.8% likelihood ratio if you have opposite eye, right? So if you shine it in the good eye that's not red and the painful eye is tender and they, the patient complains of pain when you shine the light in the other eye, that's a likelihood ratio of 28, 28 times more likely that there is some kind of severe disease going on in that red eye. The other thing that can cause pain that you should be aware of that has a likelihood ratio of 21 is when you do the finger to nose convergence test, the near synkinesis pupillary constriction. I would never remember that. But when you tell the patient, you know, you're doing visual testing, and then at the end you bring their finger, you bring your finger towards their nose, and their pupils come together to follow your finger close to their nose. If that causes pain in that red eye, a likelihood ratio of 21, significant, right? Uh, the difference in the pupils, by the way, I didn't say initially. If they, if just at first glance, when you're looking at the two pupils, if they have difference in pupil diameter more, greater than one millimeter, and one eye is red, um, the likelihood ratio of there being some severe disease is 6.5. So all these are much, 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 much more likely to put you in the ballpark of, okay, these are present. We got to be careful that this red eye is something we need to be worried about. And and all that takes is, right, have your flashlight. You take a look at the patient. Pupils equal. Great. Moving on to the next one. Uh, shine a light directly in the red eye. Super duper painful photophobia. Eight times more likely there's something we need to be worried about. Other eye and it's painful. 28 times more likely that there's something going on. Or finger to nose uh, testing. Uh, 21 times more likely that there's something severe going on. So again, uh, really easy, quick physical exam findings that could be really helpful. Uh, number two, how do we differentiate bacterial versus viral or allergic conjunctivitis? And we talk about, obviously, you know, allergic conjunctivitis is classically like itchy eyes, um, thinner discharge, it's, it's seasonal, etc. cetera. Um, but the big question is, when can I not, right? When can I not give oral, uh, uh, sorry, uh, topical antibiotics for the eye, giving eye drops, when am I safe not to do it versus when do I need to be worried about doing it? Okay. So number one, the the major finding that they talk about is matting of both eyes in the morning when it's present, the classic both eyes are mattering goopy, only has a likelihood ratio of three. Okay, so again, that's compared to the things we we're just talking about, that's a pretty weak likelihood ratio. And that right, that's the classic. That is the classic of like, oh, if both eyes are if goopy, it's not gonna be viral, that's usually only one eye. 
right? So if both eyes in the morning you wake up, goopy, 3.6 uh, likelihood ratio. If you walk in the room and you can observe purulent discharge, okay, if you can, if you, if you see purulent discharge, the likelihood ratio is about four. Why? Because viral, you don't have as much goop. So if you can literally look in their eye and see a bunch of purulent discharge, again, a likelihood ratio of four. So not crazy. The bigger thing, and I love this test. This is probably my favorite test, and it is it is the most com it is the it's the highest likelihood of ratio. If you walk in the room and at 20 feet away from the patient, you don't see a red eye. That is a negative likelihood ratio of five times. So a 0.2 in the likelihood ratio. So again, you walk in the room, you should be able to see that red eye from 20 feet away from the patient. If it's positive, bacterial. If you don't see, if you can't tell at 20 feet which eye is red, probably more likely viral, okay? Uh, so interesting. Uh, the, and then finally, um, if they don't have any gluing shut of either eye in the morning, right? But just redness or just, you know, it doesn't glued shut, but just there's some discharge, there's some boogers and, and, and they're red and a little irritated. If there's no gluing shut, three times less likely to be bacterial. So you don't want, if there's no gluing, more likely to be viral or, or um, more likely to be viral or allergic. And, and so this article, I'm not going to go into all the crazy details of the article, but they have a really good table three where they talk about um, all the different findings about, for example, if, if, you know, if they have, if the redness on the conjunctiva completely obscures, uh, obscures any of the tarsal vessels on eye exam, you know, then if that redness is that thick uh, and that intense, then you have a likelihood ratio of close to five, five times more likely that it's bacterial versus viral. Um, there's also a Reitveld score. Um, for those of you who don't know what the Reitveld score is, um, it's a it's a questionnaire that you can basically um, have the patient, you can talk to the patient about. And the four questions you ask are, are your eyes, or three, uh, three questions, right? Are your eyes glued shut in the morning? If they say both eyes are glued shut in the morning, they get plus five points. If they have one eye glued shut in the morning, it's only two points, okay? If they have a history of itching in the eyes, you minus a point because it's more likely to be viral or allergic. And if they have a history of conjunctivus, conjunct, conjunctivitis, oh my God, that was brutal. Conjunctivitis, if they have a history of having conjunctivitis, you actually subtract two because it's more likely to be allergic or again in the kid, viral. Um, so I thought that was really interesting, that, that score. And if you have a score of four or more, so basically if you have two eyes glued shut, it's a uh, likelihood ratio of positive six six times more likely. If you have a negative score, you are almost assuredly not going to have bacterial pink eye. So I thought that was pretty interesting. Um, winter is actually more likely to have bacterial because um, obviously viral, uh, or sorry, in the summertime, we tend to have more uh, allergies. Um, so that was, I thought, also pretty interesting um, and pretty intuitive. So again, a quick review of the physical exam for the red eye, things that you should be looking forward to that are actually relevant physical exam maneuvers. Uh, and there's a lot of, if you look on these charts in here, there's a lot of physical exam maneuvers or symptoms even um, that don't have m much change in the likelihood ratio, right? So if you have follicular conjunctivitis or papillary conjunctivitis, it really doesn't matter. Um, the, the likelihood ratio isn't statistically significant. That physical exam isn't gonna help you really. Um, what type of discharge do you see on physical exam? If there's no discharge, yeah, probably not bacterial, but only by a factor of two, um, only a likelihood ratio of 0.4, meaning that it's, le it's less likely to be bacterial if there's no discharge. Watery discharge present, again, 0.4, but those uh, but that uh, confidence interval crosses the, it's non-statistical. Um, mucousy discharge, again, uh, mucousy discharge, which, you know, oftentimes we think bacterial, only slightly more likely to be bacterial because viral infections can be quite mucousy uh, with their discharge, but it's that thick purulent discharge that you really need. Um, again, so the amount of conjunctivitis Really, that, that door test I really love. Um, that redness completely obscures the torsal vessels. I also love um, as a as a means of it needs to be really really red um, for you to be able to definitively say if this is bacterial or uh, viral. They do make um, testing swabs uh, to 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 swab for um, adenovirus and other uh, viral types that you can swab. But why charge the patient when you can use actual uh, relevant and scientific um, uh, physical exam testing? So again. Uh, like, like I like to talk about with my med students about physical exams, 
There's lots of things we do in the physical exam that has a terrible likelihood ratio that is pretty much a coin flip about and, and is maybe even less helpful than it is more helpful. Um, so I want to talk about the couple of exam findings that are really, really clinically valuable to do and should help guide your decision making um, in something that we see all the time in primary care. So hopefully this was helpful. Hopefully this type of topic is, since we've never done this type of physical exam topic before, um, I think, I, again, I, I want to do some more of these series, but focusing less on like what to do in a physical exam, but what specific tests actually have scientific evidence to support them and which ones don't because there's a ton of stuff we do on physical exam that that really don't have much evidence behind uh, the, their benefit so anyways uh hopefully this was helpful uh thanks for tuning in this week uh, we'll see you next week with another episode reminder you don't need to stay up all night to stay up to date thanks and have a great week